Hello, uh, this is our next presentation. It is collaborating across workflows, managing creative assets from Legacy Works, and this will be presented by Patrice Andre Prudhomme and Jennifer Hunt Johnson. Patrice is the head of digital collections, and Jennifer is the conservator and preservation specialist, both from Illinois State University. And I will pass it off to them. Well, hello, everyone. Um, so, Jen and I will be presenting on collaborating across workflows, managing creative assets from legacy works. So, now let's, uh, let's give you an overview of our presentation. Uh, we will start on who we are, in the sense that this presentation focuses on practical professional development in all stages of digital asset management. Um, in that it is to manage legacy projects more efficiently through sustainable solutions, where digital assets then become the primary point of access for the public. Then we will look into challenges in part uh, personnel, resources, and space. Then what do we mean by collaboration? Then we will look at workflow case scenarios. How do we make sense of this as a team in addressing the digital asset management stages? Uh, looking at a crowdsource transcription example, and another example is in-house project with the objective to teach those um, for a special collection, sorry, special collections to teach those resources. And then we will conclude with learning outcomes. Just to give you a brief introduction about who we are, um, Patrice and I represent Milner Library at Illinois State University. Um, we have uh, an enrollment of about 20,000 students 86% uh, are undergraduates. Um, and so what sets Milner apart maybe from other academic libraries is that our holdings include uni unique collections with strong local and regional interests. For example, um, a couple, just to name a couple, our Kenway Studio Collection uh, is a group of photographic materials that were produced locally that have both regional and national significance, including some subjects such as uh, State Farm and Standard Oil. Um, and then another collection that uh, is very well known for us is our circus collection. Bloomington Normal has been an important home for circus and allied arts. We have a lot of material that documents that history um, and our connection to the global circus community. So in that sense, um, our collections have that really strong appeal to the communities that they come from. Our mission is to create access to those things, but also discoverability is a really big part of that. We're trying to make sure that through digital collections, we can reach out to the community, let them know what sort of resources we offer here, and make those connections um, between people and materials, uh, get them to be able to access things that are of most interest to them. We're going to take a closer look at two main departments that are at play here at Milner. Um, we both represent two very small shops, uh, mine being preservation and conservation, uh, and Patrice representing digital collections. Just a, as a, a quick point of comparison, um, our model is a little different than what you might find in a lot of other institutions. Um, digital collections here is very independent from preservation. We historically have operated as isolated units, um, but as you'll see in this presentation, we've started to find commonality, um, you know, as both of our departments reach across library units. We've also formed relationships across campus and the community um, with a lot of shared interaction. So some of the main content providers that we both service are special collections, university archives, and then we also have a number of peripheral entities. Um, for example, we've got collections that belong to donors or other faculty, um, and they may or may not have a specific home within the library, yet we service them either through digital collections or also preservation does uh, do work for those things as well. So when we take a closer look at the work um, that goes on in each of our departments, we find that our challenges are not unique. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the issues that we're gonna talk about here are familiar issues to all of you. Um, I'm just going to go through a list of a few of those things. 
the first being personnel. For both conservation and digital collections, um, we really rely on people that have highly specialized skill sets. So we're looking at you know, very particular types of workflows. Um, not only do we only have you know, maybe a, a limited or smaller staff, um, attracting the right set of staff to our workflows is, takes a little bit of extra work and is a challenge. Restricted resources such as money, facilities, uh, getting the right technology, and also time um, are certainly factors that we have to contend with as well. So to build capacity in each of our workflows, we have to maximize the use of all of those resources across our teams and across our areas of expertise. Space is a particular resource. Um, we're gonna talk about this a little later in the presentation. Um, but having a, a, a physical space that meets the needs uh, to manage all of the um, photography equipment that we use, um, we have very specific needs in this area as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about how collaborating and identifying our common needs, um, as well as advocating for one another, has helped us to overcome some of those limitations of space. And then finally, uh, siloed decision making. Um, is something that we both kind of interact, find uh, as an issue. We all know that it's really easy to get focused on your own work and isolated within your department, um, but to be an advocate for other units and to work together, you have to have a really good understanding of the needs of all of the players involved. Um, conservation and digital collections, because we interact with so many other units, this is something that I think comes natural uh, as, as a challenge that we identify with on a regular basis and something that we kind of try to work forward with. In a nutshell, we're trying to generate successful outcomes from assignments and ensure sustainability and efficiency in the work that we do. And we're looking to collaboration to help facilitate this. So what do we mean by collaboration? Collaboration is the underpinning of our work efforts to ensure quality in digital asset management. And this starts with a thorough understanding of the departments we share our workflows with. With better understanding, we can develop creative solutions that respect our mutual goals. We can advocate for one another, and this helps to ease our way through some unnecessary roadblocks. By promoting flexibility, we enhance our services and learn together as we tackle common problems. So really it's a lot of that is about getting to know each other's workflow. Um, we can help kind of back each other up through communication in that way. For our two units, we've identified access, discoverability, and preservation of collection materials uh, as shared goals that we're each actively working towards. However, uh, as we all know, collaboration can take us outside of our comfort zone the path to reach these goals can take many different avenues. We know instinctively that collaboration will force us to consider challenging ideas and new methods of working. So we have to really focus on committing to being open and working through those challenges um, and knowing that uh, we may have to adjust our own individual ideas about moving forward um, to kind of be more inclusive of other people's ideas uh, in a truly collaborative nature. So here, um, this quote from Ann Landers, opportunities are usually disguised as hard work, so most people don't recognize them. I really like this quote. Um, I think we have to be kind of careful when it, it sort of gives a suggestion that there's an aversion to hard work. Um, I don't think that's exactly what she's trying to say here, but I think um, hard work, uh, it can be more about being overwhelmed or intimidated by uh, some incorrect assumptions about what it actually takes to get a certain project done. So in this sense, collaboration can be the tool that makes workflow uh, more efficient for quicker outcomes. Um, we can't always predict the outcome of any given project, um, but we can try to allay the fears that the work will not be worthwhile. So in that sense of being intimidated, um, the more that we're able to talk together and develop those solutions, um, we might see that 
the type of work we need to do is not really as insurmountable as we might think it is. We can use collaboration to promote awareness by understanding relationships between services that we offer. We can better communicate those solutions uh, to some of our shareholders that are unfamiliar with the details in our process. We need to communicate a consistent message to our colleagues and advocate for the right service for the project. So that's not necessarily the service that we individually provide, um, but knowing kind of where uh, each other's can meet the, that, that need, we're always putting forward the best service to meet the end goal. So again, that's a way to meet those goals of access, discoverability, and preservation. It makes our work appear more manageable. It can soften the constraints of reaching these goals. Um, so again, you know, do we have the right resources to do a project? Um, you know, are we sort of in, intimidated perhaps that we need to outsource work to a vendor? Um, by talking together and really working through with more ideas, you know, we might be able to identify partners that are within the library or across campus, or as we'll see later by using the community, um, who are able to offer what we need to get very specific work done. Um, and also help us not feel so isolated in accomplishing the task at hand. In this way, we push for the creativity and reach answers that maybe weren't tangible otherwise. So our sample, our sample workflows have a lot to offer, uh, including addressing the digital asset management stages. And um, so let's introduce two sample workflows to illustrate our process as they could open broader possibilities to access collections, to leverage low cost solutions, and to drive multiple patterns of use. So if we begin with the Peoria Secrets Scribe, which is a crowdsource transcription that allows, would allow them to uncover the past, engage with the community, enhancing discoverability by means of growing the metadata that we may not know anything about and save time. And then we also have another example, the historical costume. In this case, we are redefining access to the physical object, a physical object that is, or may be fragile, deteriorating, or in any case, a physical object that with the purpose that special collection has is to use it for teaching. So how do we define digital asset management? Well, there are different definitions uh, you can see on listed here, but after consideration of some of those definitions, we identify the stages of digital asset management to be creation, organization, cataloging, retrieval, sharing, and storage. So with that in mind, we think that there are great benefits to engaging with the community. And the first example, the Peoria's Secret Scribe, is one example that would offer the opportunity to learn from one another, build on the knowledge of the citizen, uncover the past, and share findings online. So this crowdsourced transcription example is relatively linear process. In most, but in, in any case, in most cases, analogs are retrieved for the digital transformation part of the process, where we seek to engage with the community and beyond. So I guess we are looking to make sense of the content that had been donated at some point in time. And in a sense, it is a community project, a virtual partnership that allows us to build the minimal metadata it potentially stir, spurs sorry, excitement and, and interest. The second project that um, we have worked on is uh, the historical costumes, which is um, effectively a scrapbook um, with original artwork by Charles Bianchini. Um, and in this example, um, we have kind of more of a what we consider a nonlinear example. Um, this was a piece that came first to preservation for physical treatment, um, but in the process of assessing that item, uh, it 
became clear that perhaps by involving digital collections, we could also meet another need of making this piece more accessible uh, in a digital way, as well as complementing physical access and meeting that goal of preservation. So we're really addressing preservation through alternative means, and we're using digital asset management to create supplemental points of access. Um, it creates more accessibility for the object and allows it to be truly digital or truly usable. The poor con condition that you see, um, you can probably get a good sense of that in this image. Uh, a lot of the paper here is extremely brittle and flaking. And the main concern was that every time it came out uh, to be used during a class, they would lose little bits of the pages. From a conservation point of view, there's very little we can do to um, make the paper itself more stable. So that's always gonna be an issue. However, because the object is so popular, um, it will continue to want to have use. So by creating a digital version of the object, um, the details that need to be scrutinized for scholarship can be done through the digital version. And then the physical object becomes more like a museum piece and can be, uh, it, it will limit that physical handling um, and make it more uh, sustainable over the long term. So again, kind of that path coming through preservation, bouncing back to digital collections, where we're really kind of moving and working together um, as, as more of a single unit um, by communicating with each other. But either way, promotion of this unique work becomes a really desired product of digital asset management. And by creating a digital object, um, we're also going to enhance discoverability. So more people, hopefully in our community, will be aware that we have this. Um, we may see an increase in use of the object um, while still maintaining preservation. So we're kind of interested to see how this uh, becomes used in future once we do complete the digital work for this project. So let's look at the, the workflow as the big picture. As stated earlier, most content that Jen and I get comes from special collections and archives. It may also come from donors or emeritus professors, for example. One critical part of the project management process is to ensure that we cover copyright, particularly for the digital transformation of the materials and online publishing, for example. So the Peoria Secret Scribe is, is a good example for that. Besides digital collections, preservation is the other department that collects material, such as historical costumes, as we just looked at, for treatment or repair. It is at that cross section that we can talk about collaboration between two departments that are looking into solving a common problem. And in this case, to create digital assets, which would be in uh, the first stage of the digital asset management creation, where another layer of collaboration emerges with the crowdsourcing. When we reach out to the community as a resource for historical documents. As we reach out to the community at large, entries are reviewed. And in most cases, we collect a level of metadata that we did not have from the start, particularly when it helps transcribe manuscripts or other types of historical documents. This is very valuable. Then we extract the information from the platform Scripto in Omeka, the one we use, the option, and organize it. We ingest the content in a digital collection management system, and in our case, ContentDM, and pass on the OAI information to the cataloging department to make the collection retrievable and shareable via the library catalog. By organizing and ingesting the digital assets into the digital collections management system, we meet our goals in that we ensure that the collection is accessible retrievable and shareable. Another important facet to this is the added value for research of the resource. 
From the perspective of preservation, while materials could be stabilized either prior to digitization or not, materials can also be completely repaired with the understanding that physical handling will then become more restrictive, as in historical costumes. In this case scenario, the digitized book can be used for teaching and the analog uh, piece is preserved, more like a museum piece with minimal to no handling. And then teaching with the book can also enhance the research value of the source. So in a sense, that digital transformation of the analog is redefining access to the physical object. Lastly, there is one more stage of digital asset management we would like to consider is it is storage. However, prior to doing so, we get into basic preservation by using data accessioner as a front end processing tool. With that, we accession the digital assets and do a fixity check of the digital assets, such as generating checksum, where we can also integrate common metadata at the time of migration rather than after the fact. So what else does this partnership bring? We're getting back to that issue of space and resources again. Both preservation and digital collections require a lot of specialized equipment to do their work, in addition to adequate space that might include um, room to safely maneuver with our collections as we're working, uh, particularly with the rare material, um, and also having some function of security to the space. In seeking out a space for preservation to do photo documentation, uh, we reached out to digital collections because they're performing a lot of the same work with very similar equipment um, for different purposes. The result of this was a joint proposal to request space and equipment that both units could share. We're able to consolidate the need for specialized and expensive equipment um, and avoid duplication, which saves money and maximizes the actual use. So for instance, Conservation is really doing doc, photo documentation um, maybe once a month or something like that. However, we need really specialized equipment to do it. Um, by being able to share a studio space, uh, we're able to get access to the higher technology we need, um, but also work out um, some kind of work together to get those things uh, figured out with digital collections who support us. Um, by sharing, uh, it's a really good option because not only are we sharing physical things, but um, we're also sharing knowledge. So looking at how to set up projects um, and preservation can kind of weigh in as digital collections uses equipment to make sure we're all on the same page with how to safely deal uh, with our material. To summarize, we look to identify projects with a new eye. Uh, preservation reviews can uncover candidates for digitization that are good selections based on the type of condition that we might see. For instance, flat sheets, uh, poor quality but manageable paper, uh, objects with unique characteristics. Um, uh, we're very well aware that those are always great candidates for digital collections. So those are projects that I can, can know to encourage our collection managers to share with digital collections because I'm very understanding of the services that can be provided. This of course goes both ways. So a lot of times digital collections will see projects that clearly have some needs for preservation attention um, and they can advocate that those things come to my attention. Collaboration develops through communication, brainstorming and problem solving to meet the needs of the project at hand. And our open discussion is facilitated as ideas flow between our departments. So we focus a lot on the work and our ultimate goals and less on um, pre-established workflows that we might just have within our, our departments. We openly pursue the development of both physical and digital assets and continue advocating for each other. Um, we make various articulation points, meaning um, the way we're able to communicate with our subject specialists um, by having two of us approach projects and be able to share, uh, share ideas, um, we're able to kind of reach those collection managers and help explain the process in ways that they are more comfortable with to reach, uh, make sure we're really servicing what 
uh, what their ultimate goal is, even if they may have a preconceived idea of what techniques are needed to, to reach that. Um, we explain our options from different angles and we can increase understanding. So what lessons can we share? What is the takeaway? How does this fit with our learning outcomes? We see that collaboration is the underpinning of digital asset management and our work efforts to enhance effectiveness and flexibility in maximizing services and solving a common problem. By advocating for one another, we find ways to more easily bypass difficulties as compared to sole acting. We inform each other. We also keep track of our work by generating documentation across the team, thus enhancing interconnectedness. In light of the apparent complexity of these workflows, we are working to streamline them and make better sense of our practical professional development in all stages of digital asset management. Our focus is to meet expectations, educate content providers about what each process is about and why collaboration is a must for good asset management. In closing, in closing, we would like to thank our colleagues and content providers who have helped us in the development of this work. Thank you very much for listening. Please ask us questions and we will answer them in our capacity. Well, thank you for that great presentation. Uh, we are now ready for our Q&A session. So our first question is, someone wants to know why you use Dublin Core rather than BRA Core. So, um, although the, 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 when I first be, began this, this work, uh, the, two the first two collections were mapped uh, using VRA Core. Uh, those two collections were focusing on art primarily. And as we, as we have been growing the digital collections, um, we wanted to, I think, I think we used, uh, we wanted to look at something with more flexibility in the mapping, uh, something that better fit the digital collections uh, as a whole uh, beyond uh, being art collections. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, someone wants to know what the differences are between using a camera versus a scanner. Okay, um, I can address that. Um, with our setup um, here, we actually, we do use both, um, both scan, uh, scanner and um, camera setups. Uh, we also do have a better light setup, uh, camera setup as well. Um, I think that, again, sort of working together in that studio space, um, predominantly we're doing camera setup work there. Um, that's something that typically involves a lot more preservation um, interaction, just because we're often dealing with bound material that may need specialized supports or um, that sort of manipulation. Um, so, you know, my interaction in working with digital collections kind of helps figure some of those problems out. Um, and we have, uh, you know, a lot of flexibility in the way we can set up. In contrast, using the flatbed scanner is um, much easier. Uh, it's limited by size. So we're kind of dealing with objects that are um, usually more like, I think, uh, 11 by 14 or something smaller. Um, so those are projects that we can look to uh, maybe involve our student staff um, because they involve a lot less handling concerns. Um, so if we're looking to get things uh, more, you know, if we need to get some quicker projects through, um, we kind of keep our eyes out for some of those flat items that might work really well on the scanner. Okay, great. Um, let's see, our next question, have you considered the benefits of merging your two areas into a single functional area? This is a very good, this is, this is Patrice, this is a very good question. In fact, we have, I'd say, I would say, yes, we have, Jen and I have spoken about it. We, I don't, I'm not sure we have reached the next level of presenting, presenting or maybe writing a proposal about this. And I think we have a good rationale for doing so. 
I would add to that, um, uh, you know, the conservation unit in particular is one that is, um, has seen a lot of transition and is also growing. So um, I don't know that we've sort of fully gotten to that, that level yet of, of considering that um, uh, merging of the departments, but I would say that already we're seeing a lot of integration in the way we work together um, and managing the things that come to each of us. Um, so informally, in some ways, we do uh, operate, um, do tend to operate a lot together. Okay. Um, this next question is kind of a follow-up to the first one. Why did you switch from VRA Core to Dublin Core? Um, well, when I first started in this in this position, uh, yes, it was VRA Core, and I think uh, the well, I think the for what we intended to do then, Dublin Core seemed to make more sense, and it seemed. I don't know, it seemed to be more agreeable to what, what our objectives were at the time. And if we've kept with it and, and uh, you know, followed up with some DMS, Dublin Core, DMCI uh, conference, and, uh, and you guess you get involved in it, there's always a way also to use the, um, the more advanced version of it, even though it's not always retrieved from EBSCO, but um, uh, so we keep with, we stay with a simple version of Dublin Core. But it's, uh, I would say it suits our needs well at this time. Okay. Um, let's see. Could you talk a bit more about how you collaborate with subject specialists? Well, the, the, subject, the subject specialists, they say whether we want to speak directly to them or we would like to speak to get in contact with faculty on campus, uh, when some faculty reach out to us, we, we definitely make sure that we, we work together on this. Um, some of the sub subject specialists have offered some pretty good resources in terms of, for example, the, the collections that uh, Jen mentioned, the Voices of Extremism and even the Pottery. Because not only we do work with them, but we also are keep in mind the curriculum, how it could extend into the curricula on campus, and uh, you know whatever course uh, may where those collections may fit in, maybe for a student portfolio or whatever how it could be integrated into courses. So that's I think that's really when our uh, relationship here is is being taking more importance, but definitely at the start. In terms of the prospection, uh, we I think collabor that collaboration at that level to me is I think is is very important. So we end up having something as a whole as a library, uh, different units, different areas, and more cohesive. All right. Um, all right, our next question. Um, what tool did you use for the crowdsourcing? And could you also maybe talk a little bit about how you um, promote awareness of the crowdsourcing opportunity? So the tool that is used for crowdsourcing is Scripto, but it is actually so it's an open source platform. And is the, in this case, it is done through Omeka. I think there are other ways to use Scripto through DSpace, I believe. And I think there's another one I can't think of it now. But um, so once it's digitized, we just ingest it in there. But we need to be in the system. It needs to be promoted. It has been promoted by means of our public relation librarian. So uh, in, and, and this, of course, there's collaboration with as noted earlier with special collections and archives where the, the these content providers provide the more specific information about those collections i think they're the ones who know the most about it about those collections rather and um i think it is also supported by say i know for sure that for special collections and archives they do promote on their own and these collections um when uh, I have a chance, uh, then I, um, I also promote those at some venue. Uh, and for example, this webinar is also another way for us to promote this to a greater audience. 
All right. Um, it looks like we just have a couple more questions here. Um, was all the work for both of these projects done in-house or was anything outsourced? At this point in time, um, you know, there, it's, um, it's actually, it doesn't seem to take that much time, but actually it does in a sense because there's also includes the review part before, you know, extending this to the shareable and the retrievable information. Uh, all this was done actually in-house. Um, some of the content has come to us at different times uh, when it seemed to be more important than other and we accommodated our workflow. Um, I guess we have more than one workflow, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, have other workflows than the one I have with Jen, but we did accommodate, I did accommodate the workflows to, to have those posted um, in a timely fashion. But in-house, yes. Okay. Um, and it looks like um, the last question we've got at this point is, what tool are you using for digital preservation? Well, data accessioner is definitely the one that we use in this um, as we, uh, as as I have, say because uh, this actually, as I have been presented at different workshops through Digital Power, uh, P O W R R, it was by a grant from 2011-2014, uh, edited by Northern Illinois University. Um, we use Data Accessioner kind of a basic to start really the basic digital preservation. Then the information after that, the data is going to be is sent to a cloud. Um, that's, I would say that's uh, relatively decent at this point in time, I think, considering you know, the resources, but at least then we are able, that, that means also in terms of the storage to allow more than one copy, uh, ge geographically dispersed. So at least we're eating a couple of things here. Definitely the accessioning with the fixie check, the checksum, and uh, we're producing the, um, the, the submission information package and then geographically dispersed um, um, storage. But we do not use anything at this point in time other than like, for example, um, Archive Metica or Meta Archive or, or uh, Dura Cloud. It's not yet in the docket. Um, how are you funding this project to sustain it for the long term? Um, what project are you referring to? Um, I think I think both both of the projects. Oh, oh do you mean the, both of the workflows? Um, the digitization projects, I would imagine. Oh, those are actually is basically our current workflow is based on. Um, library resources, I would say. Okay. Um, so it's just part of um, the kind of work calendar of the library then? Yes, that's a good way to put it, yes. yes. Okay. Um, could you talk about how the digital collection workflows integrate with analog archival processing? Um, well, definitely, we, let me see, uh, with the archival processing. Well, um, we do come at the front, I guess, the front end, but um, the, we do produce, we do, I'm, could, I'm sorry, could you explain a little more of the question, even though we come at the end and the, some of the archive do want to save some online? Um, I think they're wanting to know, um, you know, like if um, an item is being, or a collection is being, the analog collection is being processed, okay. is the digital workflow integrated in that analog processing in any way? Yes, this is done. Um, this is, I guess, my other work, the other, the, the other workflows that I have with archives and uh, special collections and this would be more the workflow that is done, uh, not the one, the historical costume, but the, somewhat similar to the crowdsourcing. Um, if, any, if any doubt 
uh, and we want to make sure then Jen intervenes and make sure, you know, it's, I think it's fair that she looks at a, she has a quick look at how we can handle the materials from archives um, or special collections, but to send it to archival um, that would align with some of the digital preservation approach, uh, I say basic in quote, that we do along with archives as well. As our archivist is, is certified and actually we work this together. Uh, and some of, the, some of those are also sent to internet archive that archives sends directly. In this case, it would, I don't intervene in this. Uh, it's basically goes from archives to uh, digital archives. All right, um, we have just a few more minutes for questions. Does anyone else have anything to add? Uh, all right, it looks like that might be, oh, here's one more. <laughs> um, in reference to the point, complex workflows benefit from various articulations on the summary slide, what methods of communication are used? Um, I think a lot of uh, the communication we're talking about here is um, mostly sort of developing an awareness. A lot of times, um, Patrice and I are meeting uh, with our subject specialists um, and in isolated meetings, um, we may not always kind of be aware um, who's seeing which projects as they come up. But I think what's uh, important as far as how we're articulating things um, you know, I certainly come at uh, all of these projects from a preservation standpoint, and Patrice has a lot of other um, context to add in terms of, you know, providing access. Um, but I think in having, continuing to have conversations with each other, um, we're kind of shaping similar ideas. So should I have a, con um, a meeting with special collections, for instance, um, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking about uh, and kind of have my eyes open to what might be, um, you know, good project for Patrice, but how can I explain that to special collections um, in a way that sort of, uh, you know, talks about preservation, but also, you know, have we thought about how the piece is being used? And I think that is something that I try to articulate in most conversations. What is our end result? How are people going to interact with this piece? And sometimes that is settled by um, a, a preservation, conservation treatment, but a lot of times that can be um, perhaps better served by uh, digital collections. So always making sure we have um, the same kind of terminology uh, to kind of help help communicate to our uh, our subject specialists in that way. All right. All right, um, so it looks like we've got maybe just a few seconds left for any last questions. All right, well, um, if anyone has any additional questions, um, those can be sent to the presenters by email. Um, otherwise, um, thanks for everyone um, for being here with us. Um, our, we're going to take a 10 minute intermission now while we get set up for the next presentation and that will um, get started at 2.55. Thanks everybody.